Um, we're going to be, um, we have a wonderful guest speaker here today, Mr. Wade Herring. Um, Wade is a partner in the Savannah office of Hunter McLean, where he has practiced law since 1985. Mr. Herring worked closely with Malcolm McLean, um, who we refer to still as Mayor McLean, um, for 15 years. Wade's law practice focuses on employment law, representing employers in management in all sectors, public and private, both profit and nonprofit. He's involved in a variety of community and professional activities. Wade is a past president of the Savannah East Rotary Club, as well as a past board chair of the Savannah Country Day School, where he served on the Board of Trustees for eight years. He's currently chair of the Board of Trustees at Wesley Monumental United Methodist Church. He's a past president of the Savannah Bar Association. He's been a member of the University of Georgia Law School Alumni Association Council since 2007, and now serve, serves as its president-elect. He is a board member of Georgia Appleseed Incorporated. Wade received his BA degree magna cum laude from Dartmouth College and his JD degree cum laude from the University of Georgia, where he was a Woodruff Scholar. He's a member of both Phi Beta Kappa and the Order of the Hoyt. Okay. Following law school, Wade clerked from 1983 to 1985 for the Honorable Dudley H. Bowen Jr., United States District Judge, Southern District of Georgia. Um, I had the privilege of seeing Wade um, give this presentation at Senior Citizens, Inc. Um, Learning Center um, lecture series. And I asked him to come and give it for us because I think, you know, we all would benefit from hearing more about Mayor McLean. And he has the unique um, experience of, you know, personal knowledge of um, Mayor McLean. I can, you know, talk about Mayor McLean and what I can pull from the municipal archives, but it certainly is different from somebody who worked with him and learned from him and was mentored by him. So with that, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to share with you about Malcolm McLean. He was my boss, my mentor, and my friend. He deserves to be remembered and I am privileged to help remember him. I am especially grateful for this opportunity to remember Mr. McLean because after he died on January 24, 2001, he had a proper Episcopal funeral, which means he had a very sorry eulogy in this Methodist opinion. <laughs> in an Episcopal service, there's a lot of the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but there's not very much about the dearly departed. Almost like Episcopalians, some historians argue that individuals are of little import because we're just bits of flotsam on the tidal wave of history swept along by forces beyond our control or understanding. You will not find me in that camp. Malcolm McLean was an individual who decided to make a difference and he did so. First, a brief note on honorifics. I always called Malcolm McLean Mr. McLean, and that is how I will refer to him today. We were 40 years apart in age. He never suggested that I call him anything else, and I never presumed to do so. I will offer suggestions about why Mr. McLean responded as he did to the civil rights movement in Savannah, but, but more than a traditional historical discussion I want to give you some sense of the man with whom I worked for 15 years. A sense of the man will also inform our understanding of Mr. McLean's role as mayor and his larger legacy. Before going further, let me say a word about sources. While there are any number of histories about the Civil Rights Movement, their portrayal of the, mo of the movement in Savannah is generally painted in broad strokes without a careful attention to the specific chronology of events or the individuals involved. As Jason Sokol observed in his book, There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Civil Rights, quote, with good reason these books collectively emphasize the struggles of black Southerners. The focus frequently remains on the civil rights movement itself. The struggle's lasting meaning often becomes overshadowed, as does its interracial impact on Southern life. Moreover, the literature of the South during this era privileges 
the dramatic demonstrations and famous battles of the civil rights movement, often at the expense of analyzing the very realm that those struggles sought to change, Southern life, black as well as white, end quote. As for primary sources, the individuals who were involved, the people inside the room negotiating with one another, are for the most part dead. I did have the benefit of a few transcribed interviews, including an interview of Mr. McLean conducted in 1990. Additionally, Stephen Tuck, a professor at Oxford in England, and ironically, the foremost expert on the civil rights movement in Georgia outside of Atlanta, uh, Stephen Tuck interviewed Mr. McLean in 1991, and I uh, was able to find the tape of that interview and actually get that tape transcribed. So I had the benefit of that as well. Here at the city, there are six volumes of, in the city archives of his papers from his time as mayor, which include at least some of his speeches from that time. But that's not at all the exhaustive extent of his, of his papers at the, as his time as mayor. And unfortunately, those papers cannot be located. Um, they're not here. They're not at my law firm. They're not at the Georgia Historical Society. I've looked. Um, the only place I can think they might still be is somewhere tucked away in his house where Mrs. McLean still lives. And one day we're going to look for them, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. The papers of W.W. W. Law, the leading black leader of the era, are in the process of being cataloged, and I look forward to the day when they will be more widely available. Savannah City Council minutes from this time are full of city business, but contain almost no reference to the civil rights movement unless one looks very carefully. For and I've looked. For example, in early August of 1963, City Council declined to rent Grayson Stadium for a Klan gathering given, quote, recent tensions, end quote. Um, one of the reasons, though, you won't find records about the Civil Rights Movement in the city records is because the meetings that were taking place between Mayor McLean and other members of the city government with leaders of the Civil Rights Movement did not take place in this building. They took place in the Manger Hotel. And uh, there was no open meetings law, there was no open records law, and one wonders, although we generally think of those laws as being positive things about transparency in government, one wonders if they could have done what they did if they had to do it with the press there and subject to open records and open meetings. There are 89 reported case decisions in which Mr. McLean is identified individually as attorney of record but they only provide the vaguest sense of who he was as a lawyer and no way provide a sense of him as a man. As for reported court decisions about the civil rights movement in Savannah, leaving aside the school desegregation cases, and there are lots of those, I could find only two cases, Wright v. State, which is a Georgia Supreme Court case from 1961, which concerns a challenge to the convictions of civil rights organizers for unlawful assembly and disturbing the peace in Daffin Park. And then a second case, NAACP versus Overstreet, a 1965 Supreme Court decision, State of Georgia, and that decision affirmed an award of damages against the NAACP in a case filed by a Savannah grocer who was suing the NAACP for his loss of revenue caused by an economic boycott at his store after the grocer had discharged and perhaps physically abused a 14-year-old black employee the grocer had accused of stealing. So those, that's the legal record of the civil rights movement in Savannah. None of those cases, neither one of those cases, have anything to do with Mr. McLean. All of that said, when we talk about sources, the internet opens up resources to even the most casual of researchers. Tables of content and indexes for many books can be reviewed without charge at Amazon.com and thus allowing an easy assessment of whether the resource may be helpful. Google makes available online over 30 million books whose copyrights have expired. Organizations as varied as the city of, this, of Savannah and the Episcopal Church all have websites with a surprising depth of content. 
The Civil Rights Digital Library features a collection of unedited news film from WSB Atlanta and WALB Albany, television archives held by the Walter J. Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards collection at the University of Georgia Libraries. These film clips include footage shot in Savannah during the summer of 1963. Luciana Spraker, director of the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives, wrote a wonderful paper, Three Generations of Malcolm McLean, and I relied on it heavily. I have remained friends with Mrs. McLean, and I interviewed her as well as the McLean children, John and Nancy. John is an administrative law judge here, and he was especially helpful in providing insights about why Mr. McLean responded as he did to the Civil Rights Movement. I started working with Mr. McLean in July of 1985, almost 19 years after he had been voted out of office as mayor. When we began working together, Mr. McLean was 66 years old and I was 26. He was busy running the law firm as its senior partner while also managing his own still successful and very active law practice. I was busy learning how to be a lawyer. I grew up in Macon and I knew nothing of Savannah's 20th century history or Mr. McLean's role in it and Mr. McLean did not discuss it. We were busy about other things. Over the years as I learned more about Savannah and Mr. McLean, we talked some about his political career but only briefly and only on a handful of occasions and one of my regrets is that I should have pressed him more. I should have interviewed him and created one of those transcripts. He was very much about the business at hand. He did not dwell on the past or on himself. For some people, Mr. McLean observed, politics was like liquor or chasing women, a bug they never got over. As for himself, he had been cured of politics when he lost his bid for re-election in 1966. So what was it like to work with Mr. McLean? First and foremost, Mr. McLean loved being a lawyer. He enjoyed the intellectual challenge, the competition of advocacy and negotiations, the history and tradition of the law. He was proud to serve his clients and to provide guidance and solutions for their problems. As much as he loved the intellectual challenge of the law, Mr. McLean also understood that the law is a business. If a client was more than 45 days late in paying the firm's bill on a matter in which I had been actively engaged, he would stand at my door and instruct me to telephone the client and inquire about payment, all the while wringing his hands and apologizing to me with exaggerated sincerity about how sorry he was to soil my hands with the unseemly lessons of commerce. I once heard him dictate the following letter to a client who was slow to pay. Your check came. We were glad. It bounced. We were sad. <laughs> we are like the parking meter. We do not work unless you put money in. Sincerely, Mac. <laughs> On or about December 31 of each year, as the books were closed, Mr. McLean would declare, well, boys, we made it through another year. Now we have to start all over again. At the same time that he worried about keeping the lights on, very much a child of the Great Depression. Mr. McLean quietly and routinely accepted pro bono referrals from Georgia Legal Services. He represented other individuals for no fee or a reduced fee. Especially in Mr. McLean's later years, any number of widows from all walks of life, rich and poor, white and black, depended upon him for advice and counsel without a fee. When one frail and eccentric widow contacted Mr. McLean for help after her family had threatened to have her involuntarily committed, Mr. McLean forcefully informed the probate judge at the time that if he signed the commitment order, then Mr. McLean would sue the judge personally for habeas corpus and every civil rights violation he could think of. The commitment order was not signed and the woman's family angrily told Mr. McLean that if he were so concerned, then he could look after the woman himself. And so he did. For many years afterward, 
until she died of an advanced old age. Mr. McLean was a creative and energetic thinker, but very much tied to the practical. He believed in the rule of do. He frequently arrived at the office in the morning holding scraps of paper scribbled with his ideas from the night before. He was one of the last great general practitioners, not only a litigator, but also adept at tax, trust and estates, bonds and real estate. He was a voracious reader, especially of history, often devouring a book a day. As much as he loved the competition of the law, Mr. McLean absolutely believed in following the rules. He told more than one of us if the lesson were needed, that clients pay for our best talents, our hardest work, and our total dedication and loyalty. Clients do not buy our souls. We do not get paid to lie. My former law partner, Brooks Stilwell, some of you might know him, <laughs> that's when he was still at the law firm with me. Now he's at the city, of course. You've aged him. <laughs> but Brooks Stilwell told me when I first prepared this talk that the challenge for me and a presentation about Mr. McLean would, do, would be to provide the meat, but without the salt. In the interest of accuracy, however, some salt cannot be avoided. Certainly, by Savannah standards, Mr. McLean was a liberal. He wrote monthly letters for Amnesty International and supported such causes as the Southern Poverty Law Center. During the Reagan years, Mr. McLean frequently commented on the BS content of the president's speeches, although Mr. McLean willingly admitted it was good sounding BS. <laughs> Even so, Mr. McLean was a member and former president of the Oglethorpe Club and the Cotillion Club. Like his grandfather before him, he was also a member and former president of the St. Andrews Society. He could walk with crowds, but kept his virtue. He walked with kings, but never lost the common touch. And at the end of the day, labels are not so very helpful when we are trying to understand other people. Mr. McLean had a stiletto sharp sense of humor. He frequently summarized his views with a succinct stage aside. Only his stage asides were easily heard by anyone paying attention. Whenever and wherever the landings came up in conversation, he muttered, that last great bastion of the middle class. Similarly, whenever the names of certain of his fellow parishioners at Christ Church popped up in conversation, Mr. McLean would softly say, hand raiser. I had no idea what this meant, and I finally asked him. You know, he replied, early service, guitar strumming, <laughs> hand raiser. Like many lawyers, Mr. McLean enjoyed a good story whether as narrator or as listener. Of course, the typical good story is at someone else's expense. That's what makes it a good story. Numerous times I heard him laugh at the punchline, then grow quietly reflective and say, it's funny so long as it's not you. He had a fundamental sense of fairness, a mix of morality and pragmatism, summarized in the maxim, quote, the sun don't shine up the same dog's asshole twice, end quote. When appropriate, Mr. McLean was a firm believer in economy of expression. Years ago, when our partner Arnold Young wrote Mr. McLean about the uncertainty of a start date with the law firm, because Arnold did not know whether the Navy would discharge him in September or October, Mr. McLean wrote back only, I will see you when the leaves begin to turn. Many letters went out on law firm letterhead under the signature of Mac with only one word in the body, either yes or no. But when it suited him, Mr. McLean was a master dissembler, telling stories about the Navy, about Yale, about the Battle of Chickamauga, about anything in the world other than the subject of the current meeting, which might not be going as well as Mr. McLean would have liked. Savannah attorney Dana Braun, upon the occasion of Judge A. Van Edenfield's portrait dedication some years ago, explained the literary device of mordant syntax, a method of describing someone by defining what he is not. About Judge Edenfield, Dana explained, patient he is not. 
The same description applied with full force to Mr. McLean. Patient, he was not. Mr. McLean frequently gave an assignment with the disclaimer, whenever you get around to it. This instruction meant to begin work immediately. <laughs> it did not matter that the project might not be due for 30 days. Other projects and deadlines were of no consequence. If he gave the assignment at 9 o'clock in the morning, by 10.30 a.m. that same day, he was back in your office asking, how are you coming? As an aside, most of the cases in those formative years, most of the cases I worked on in those formative years, were in federal court, either in front of Judge Edenfield or Judge Anthony Alimo. Two quotes succinctly summarize this time in my professional life. First, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. <laughs> and second, what does not kill us makes us stronger. Mr. McLean learned his management and communication techniques as a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy during World War II. His temper was explosive and once fully engaged came in repeated waves. Just as you thought the worst was over, the tide came rushing back, crashing over your head with renewed energy and force. If you tried to walk away, Mr. McLean followed. <laughs> Picture a Marine drill sergeant close on the heels of an unfortunate private. Mr. McLean graded people. He once reluctantly gave me an A minus for ideas, but with great enthusiasm awarded me a C minus for execution. I assure you the report card was given with much more volume and vigor than I have conveyed in this retelling. He graded prominent members of the Savannah community, but I am not about to give you the results. <laughs> Anyone who worked with Mr. McLean for any length of time eventually at least had one chewing out story to tell. We wear those stories like badges of honor, proud and grateful for the experience. Our law partner Saunders Aldridge boasts that he had it the worst of all and scoffs that my experience years later was like a glass of water compared to the Atlantic Ocean. Working with Mr. McLean was so stressful when Arnold Young started at the firm, Arnold considered re-enlisting in the Navy because it was a far kinder and gentler place. But Arnold did not leave, as the rest of us did not leave, and he considers himself the better for having withstood the fires of hell. We understood that at least most of the time the anger was not personal. It was about the heat of the battle, doing the best for the client, and avoiding stupid mistakes. Once the anger was spent, it was over and forgotten. Moreover, Mr. McLean expected no less of himself than he did of other people. And while he truly hated stupid, he was supportive and understanding of the honest mistakes that can occur even after best efforts have been applied. Mr. McLean believed in work-life balance, although he would have never used such a phrase. He was devoted to his wife, Frances, and their two children, John and Nancy. He frequently told me to do what my wife, Susan, said and to pay her some attention. Otherwise, according to him, I would end up in the big divorce and I would be no good to him for at least two years. <laughs> When I told Mr. McLean that my wife Susan was pregnant with our first child, he could not have been happier for the two of us. Later that same day, he told me that although my news was mostly good, there was some bad that went with it. With prophetic truth, he said, you do not know what hardhead is until you have children of your own. Mr. McLean loved to play tennis, and one of his tennis partners, Dick Williams, is here today. Thank you, Dick. He played tennis several times a week, no matter the weather. Other frequent tennis partners were doctors Darnell Brauner and John Angel. And to see those men together was to know what true friendship is all about. Mr. McLean did not wear his religion on his sleeve, but he was active in Christ Church and served there on the vestry and as lay leader. Briefly, he even taught sixth grade Sunday school. When he told me this, I was astounded. 
I could not imagine anybody more poorly suited to deal with middle school students. And I told him so. Mr. McLean admitted the arrangement had not been long lived, as it was not satisfactory for anyone involved, <laughs> the students, the parents, or himself. For many years, Mr. McLean served as the chancellor of the Diocese of the Episcopal Church, an office much better tailored to his talents and calling. Mr. McLean was a son of Savannah and a proud descendant of Scotland. His grandfather, Malcolm McLean, immigrated at age 18 from Scotland to the United States and eventually found his way to Savannah. The first Savannah McLean fought in the Civil War. Wounded in the last days of the war at Sailors Creek, Virginia, McLean was captured and held prisoner at Fort McHenry, Maryland. He returned to Savannah and rose to prominence as a cotton factor, a successful and wealthy businessman. McLean married Mary McIntosh Mills and they had eight children. The sixth son, Malcolm Roderick, graduated from Georgia Tech and then tried his hand in the steel business in the Northeast. Malcolm married Emily Helm of Louisville, Kentucky. Their first child was Malcolm Roderick McLean, Jr., born September 14, 1919, in East Hampton, Long Island, New York. Malcolm and Emily had a second son, John Helm, born in 1921. By 1925, the McLean family was back in Savannah, settled at Grimble's Point on Isle of Hope. In his later years, Mr. McLean told me the prettiest thing he ever saw was the moon over the water between Isle of Hope and Dutch Island. Malcolm Roderick Sr. died just short of his 45th birthday in 1930, leaving his widow with two young boys at the onset of the Depression. Emily McLean, however, was a woman of formidable will. Her sons were educated at the Asheville School and the Hill School, then Yale, which they attended on scholarships. His first year at Yale, Mr. McLean waited tables for his fellow students, a job he later recalled without any enthusiasm. Mr. McLean graduated from Yale with honors in 1941 and then served in the Navy in the North Atlantic. Beginning in January of 1944, he served as commanding officer of the USS Edsel until the end of the European War. Mr. McLean was awarded the Bronze Star for Meritorious Service as commanding officer of the Edsel for his role in salvaging a burning tanker, the St. Mihiel, on April 10, 1945. Mr. McLean became commanding officer of the USS Frankovich and was headed for the Pacific when the war ended. He was forever grateful to Harry Truman. Mr. McLean was called back to the Navy in the Korean War for two years, serving in Washington, D.C., and left the Navy thereafter with the rank of commander. Meanwhile, Mr. McLean's only brother, John, had graduated from Yale in 1945, or 1942, excuse me, and joined the Army. He was killed at Normandy on July 21, 1944. Mr. McLean displayed in his office a portrait of his brother in uniform. When our mutual secretary unexpectedly lost her sister at a young age in the early 1990s, this was Mr. McLean's way of consoling her. You'll never get over it. It gets better with time, but it doesn't go away. I lost my brother in 1944, and I still think about him all the time. After the war, Mr. McLean returned to Yale to enroll in law school there, but the officials in New Haven told him he was too late to register. He had become acquainted with Boston while in the Navy, so he went there and enrolled at Harvard. Still, he never liked Harvard as well as Yale, and who can blame him? <laughs> Mr. McLean graduated from Harvard Law School in 1948 and married Frances Ravenel Grimble of Charleston, the holy city where the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers joined together to form the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> they were married in St. Michael's because where else would you get married if you're going to marry a girl from Charleston? 
After studying for and passing the Georgia bar exam, when he learned that, he, that if he were going to represent railroads, banks, and insurance companies, that he would not win many cases in Georgia, Mr. McLean joined what was then Anderson, Conrad, Dunn, and Hunter. He stayed with this firm and its subsequent iterations for the rest of his life. Back in Savannah, Mr. McLean joined the Citizens Committee, working with other young lawyers like Frank Cheatham and Malberry Smith and George Oliver to oppose the Bowen machine. Mr. McLean served as assistant city attorney for three years and then became an alderman in 1957. Upon the resignation of Mayor Lee Mingeldorf to run for county commission, city council elected Mr. McLean to become mayor on July 29, 1960. Mr. McLean and his slate of city aldermen were elected in their own right by a two to one margin in May of 1962, defeating Representative Grady Dickey and his team. Mr. McLean served as mayor until the fall of 1966 after losing to J.C. Lewis by a vote of 16,630 to 13,883. In terms of legacy, Mr. McLean has several. His family, his law firm, the many alumni of his law firm, Memorial Health, which he helped start and nurture, Gulfstream Aerospace, which he helped bring to Savannah as Grumman Aerospace, but history will remember Mr. McLean best as the leader who helped Savannah integrate with minimal violence in the summer of 1963 before the passage of the Civil Rights Act later in 1964. In early 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King famously declared Savannah to be the most integrated city south of the Mason-Dixon. So I want to talk just briefly about the civil rights movement in, uh, in Savannah. The movement had a long history here, going back to at least 1942, and the Reverend Ralph Mark Gilbert, who refounded the NAACP here, and then later was a state and regional leader of the NAACP. And the movement here had political force. By 1960, 57% of the eligible black citizens were registered voters, and they tended to vote as a bloc, and that was one way that Mr. McLean was elected in 1962. The movement was local, and that Savannah way that we like to do things, although Hosea Williams had national aspirations. The national movement did not know what to make of Savannah. So the local leaders were W.W. W. Law, and Eugene Gaston, who later became a Superior Court judge, and then Hosea Williams. That's a young Hosea Williams who was here because he was working for the federal government in one of the laboratories uh, connected with customs. Now again, the national movement didn't know what to make of, of the movement here, and they weren't <coughs> sure what was going on. Andrew Young, a very young Andrew Young, was already, of course, an assistant and colleague of Dr. King. And if you read this history, uh, Young had never been arrested at this point. And, and, and of course, to be arrested in the Civil Rights Movement was almost a badge of honor. And he was teased in the inner circles about, you've never been arrested. So they knew things were going on down here in Savannah. And they sent uh, Andrew Young down here to check on it. And in Savannah, Andrew Young was arrested. But here, here was a key, key difference between what Mr. McLean did and other city leaders did, and they were willing to engage with and talk with the civil rights leaders. And, and by comparison, Albany, Georgia, which was a very, very important part of the civil rights movement, uh, Albany, Georgia, there was no talking, lots of arrests. Um, and and uh, so we were a contrast in that. As I said at the outset, the meetings tended to be at the Manger Hotel, no open meetings laws, no open records laws in effect. The other thing that's really interesting about what Mr. McLean did is he reached out to business, and that's him during the time as mayor, but he reached out to business leaders, bankers in particular, but also to church leaders. So that's Bishop Stewart of the Episcopal Church on the left, and that's Father Toomey of the Catholic Church on the right. He monitored the police, Mr. McLean did. 
and I got to hear these stories firsthand years after the fact, but um, a very young city attorney named Jimmy Blackburn or a very young city alderman named Tom Coleman would be assigned to go monitor the marches, right? Because they were talking to each other, they knew when the marches would occur. Now the reason Blackburn and Coleman were there were not because of the people participating in the march. That's not who they were concerned about. Who they were concerned about were the police and to making sure that the police did not overreact to what was going on. Uh, I did hear this story firsthand too. The then city, uh, the then chief of police, um, I can't remember the details, but he got agitated one day and decided it would be a good idea <coughs> to fire a shotgun down the street with people in the street. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Uh, Mr. McLean informed a young city manager named Don Mendonza that there needed to be a change in the chief of police, and there was. Integration in our city was done piecemeal. They would take one project at a time, if you will. Maybe it would be the library. Maybe it would be the parks. Maybe it would be the uh, diners on Broughton Street. And they did it piecemeal by piecemeal again, talking to one another and negotiating with one another. The civil rights story in Savannah has been documented well, but no one has asked particularly why Mr. McLean chose negotiations over knocking heads. First and foremost, Mr. McLean viewed civil rights through the eyes of a lawyer. Theoretically, he understood that the law could not continue to allow United States citizens to be relegated to second class status because of the color of their skin. Practically, he believed that lawyers are problem solvers. And to solve the problem, the other side must be engaged in negotiations and discussions. And it seems to me a curious thing, and he would think it most curious, that today the idea of engaging the other side is somehow seen as weakness and that the idea of compromise is somehow seen as surrender. I think we all know that's not really how we get things done whether in our personal lives or in government or in politics. So he engaged people in negotiations and discussions. The other side may have different ideas and different perspectives, but does, that doesn't make them bad or evil. It just makes them different. Mr. McLean loved Savannah. He did not want to see the city burn, so he used a lawyer's approach to settle a case. If Atlanta was a city too busy to hate, then Savannah was a city too dignified to hate. And, and it's hard, I think, for us today to grasp how tense that summer of 1963 was. And one of these interviews that I do have the benefit of the transcript, um, he, he said, um, as scary as World War II was, that summer of 1963 was more frightening because of all of the uncertainty and the risk and you didn't know what was going on. And, and remember, his, his engagement with people was not at all what many, many white voters and many white citizens thought that he should be doing. So he had pressure from all sides. Mr. McLean had a sense of fairness and unfairness. He had worked against the Bowen machine. The Irish machine was unfair. Mr. McLean had been part of the group on the outside fighting the status quo. He knew what that was like. In his own family, Mr. McLean had experienced great loss. Both his father and his brother had died. His family had lost much of their money in the Depression, so he attended Yale on a scholarship where he waited on tables for people who had not realized loss and acted accordingly. His family had a long history of service to the community. His grandmother's family, the Mills, his great aunt Sarah Hodge, after whom Hodge Elementary is named, his uncle Charles McLean, and his McLean aunts were all generous benefactors of the poor. Mr. McLean was secure in his sense of self and in his position in the community. His family had been in Savannah for over 140 years. He had grown up with everyone in the white community. It was a small town and he knew everyone. At the law firm, Armand Hunter, 
the brother of the Colonel Hunter that the air base is named for. So his brother Ormond, who had also served in World War II. Colonel Hunter, Ormond Hunter, had Mr. McLean's back. Colonel Hunter had been a pallbearer at Malcolm Sr.'s funeral. In the 1940s, Colonel Hunter, then a member of the Board of Regents for the university system, had fought his own fight with Eugene Talmadge when the governor attempted to interfere with the University of Georgia. Mr. McLean did not have to worry about his position at the law firm. Mr. McLean's faith informed his response. In a speech he gave his mayor, Mr. McLean said the following. A careful study of the teachings of our Lord makes it quite clear that he expects his followers to be involved in the total life of the world. In Christ's name, the church must be concerned about such things as adequate housing, proper care for the aging, poverty, the United Nations population explosion, alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography, racial justice, education, and the like. Because of the church's concern, she must inevitably become involved in specifics. If there are some who do not like this, then it must be said in all Christian charity that they have not learned Christ. A Christian cannot escape his personal or his social responsibilities. Are civil rights still important? In the 12-month period ending July 2011, the United States reached a historic tipping point with Latino, Asian, mixed race, and African American births constituting a majority of births for the first time in the United States. Minorities made up 50.4% of the births, enough to create the milestone. The latest figure in 2011 was up from 49.5% just the year before. History has a way of repeating itself, but the oppressor becomes the oppressed. Remember the sun don't shine. William Roper, in the play for a man, a man for All Seasons, chastises his father-in-law, Sir Thomas More, a lawyer, for proposing that the law should protect even the devil. Sir Thomas More says, yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? Roper says, yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. And More responds, oh. And when the last law was down, and the devil turned around on you. Where would you hide? Roper, the laws all being flat. The country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you really think that you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. Well, We've come to the end of the line. As the trolley conductor used to say when he reached the terminus of the Isle of Hope, but it behooves me to say, as Mr. McLean said in his farewell address, the ride has not been without its glory. Thank you. Certainly he thought, and most people thought, uh, the reason he lost that second election was because of the stance that he had taken on civil rights. He, he was perceived by the white population as being soft on civil rights, and, and he certainly attributed his loss to the position he had taken. And I think, I think most people then did, and I think most historians also did. He also told me that it didn't seem to matter which side you took. The mayor in Albany who took exactly the opposite approach also lost his election. I mean, it was a very turbulent time. And again, I think today in 2016, uh, we forget that, uh, how, how turbulent that the, the 60s were in our country. Wait, can I make a couple of comments? Uh, 
we had some very serious discussions on the tennis court. There would be about four tennis courts and we'd be at the far end. And after every game, we would sit down and have a discussion, Darnell Brauner, John Angel, myself, and the group. And the people playing next to us, by the end of the match, were about three courts over. <laughs> they didn't like our talk. <laughs> they were all very bright people, and Malcolm was absolutely brilliant, and he was very open-minded and a good friend of Curtis Cooper. You mentioned the civil rights, and he and Curtis Cooper consulted. And I've never heard where Malcolm indicated that he had also talked to Mills v. Lane in Atlanta during that time to get input. But Malcolm, it was fun to have Darnell Brauner here, Malcolm here, and John Angel here. John was in the middle of the road and Malcolm was a little to the left. And Darnell was way over there on the right, but they were all very bright, and they all cared about Savannah and the city in the future. And I hope their spirit lives in the future here because they were very supportive of our community, all aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. And, and that is a great point. Uh, uh, Darnell Brauner was, uh, who was a great guy, but he, he was way over on the right. But yet, he was one of Malcolm McLean's best friends. And, and again, when you compare that to how we live today, we, we put each other, we put ourselves in silos, and we only listen to what we want to listen to, and we only hang out with people that we want to agree with, and we, we, we actively avoid those differences, which Maybe that's one reason it's so dysfunctional today. Uh, but, but yeah, thank you for making that point. May I make a comment that just sort of leads into that? Um, I never got to meet Mayor McLean, but I did get to interview his wife when I was writing an article. And I tried to talk to her about this period, and she was very adamant. She did not want to discuss his time about ma the ma being mayor because it was so hard on her family. And um, just very difficult time for her and um, the toll it took personally on the family. And I, to me, I think we, for, we kind of forget about um, just, you know, he came in and did his job, but it really took a toll on their personal life. And, you know, all, it sort of, there was backlash on him personally that carried on to the family. I'm curious about the meetings at the Maker Hotel that summer. Do you have any anecdotal information, like how frequently they happened, who was there, how did they come to pass, who paid the tab, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> I, I don't. I do, I do not have those details. Um, uh, I mean, having, having worked with Mr. McLean for 15 years, he, he definitely would have a vision of where he wanted to go, but at the same time, he was a, a very creative person, so there would be a lot of serendipity and my guess is that summer uh, there was a whole lot of we don't really know what we're doing but we're going to try this we're going to we're going to try something we're going to do something it might not work but, but we're going to try this i think i can uh, elaborate on that a little bit i, I went to work for mr McLean back in 1971 and i was in high school in the 60s when all this was going on and uh, I've talked to him a lot about how he handled some of that over the years. And he, because um, of course I went to politics later and he would uh, kind of mentor me a little bit. I didn't listen to him as much as I should have. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he had a great technique, as, as Luciano alluded to. Uh, what he, and, and Wade, I think, was talking about how he would take one segment, he would do the parks, and then he'd worry about Broad Street or he'd worry about something else. I, I know someone told me one time how he dealt with the movie theaters, you know, because there were there was a tremendous amount of resistance to integrating movie theaters, and well, there was a tremendous resistance to any of you who know a lot about the era to, to everything. There isn't any doubt that's why he lost that election. Anybody who lived around that time absolutely knew that. You could hear it in the 
kind of hateful comments directed at him and all. But he would go, if, if he was integrating the movie theaters, that's one I particularly remember him telling me about, he would go and find the one owner who was a friend of his, or he figured the most liberal guy he could come up with, or whatever, and he'd go and say, all right, we got to do the right thing here. And uh, you need to be the first one to integrate your theater. And the guy said, oh my God, you know, I don't know. And I'm going to catch so much hell about that. And he said, well, no, you're not. You're not going to catch any at all because what you're going to do is you're going to convene a meeting. I didn't remember if it was the Manger Hotel, but you're going to convene a meeting of all the movie company operators. And we're all going to meet and we're going to agree that you're all going to integrate on the same day. And that way nobody's going to take the heat because if one of you does it, he's going to catch hell, or the one who didn't do it's going to catch hell, and more than likely you're both going to catch hell. But if you all do it on the same day, then everybody's going to say, well, what are we supposed to do about this? And that's how he proceeded with lunch counters, movie theaters, parks, whatever. But uh, that was a wonderful speech, and, um, and I agree he certainly was... Uh, having been shoot out one once myself <laughs> and witnessed everybody who came after me get it. That was a very accurate portrayal. <laughs> you know, he was, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I believe it is, that he was the youngest skipper of a U.S. Navy ship in World War II. So he was skipper of a destroyer escort in the North Atlantic operating out of Iceland when he was, what, 22, 23 years old? So you can imagine you'd have to learn to be a little tough, but um, he didn't quit doing that when he got to the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Related question, and then I'll stop asking questions, is um, so who would be his lieutenants in all of this? It sounds like Mr. Blackburn and Mr. Coleman, like the slate that was reelected with him. Who were some of those people? Do you, re do you remember? I, I, I have the full administration roster mm -hmm. downstairs that I on our website. Um, at that time, it, now we have nonpartisan elections where mm -hmm. everybody runs on their own, but at that time you ran as a slate. Mm -hmm. So you kind of are elected in together and you're elected out together. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to pull up our administration. Well, I mean, he couldn't have done all that negotiating all the time and then it seems like you would have had people like to Mr. Coleman go talk to these people or whatever. And, and he did. He, 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 I know he relied on Tom Coleman a lot. I know he relied on uh, Mr. Blackburn, uh, if you read these interviews, um, uh, Bishop Stewart and Father Toomey were very helpful. Mm -hmm. You uh, have African American leadership, you have the Jewish leadership, mm -hmm. you have different right. groups in the community that they're working with. Right, all, all right, that's right. I just want to add, my grandmother was part of it. all of this. She helped integrate Johnson. And the reason I came was because Malcolm McLean's name was the name we heard in our house often for someone who was very instrumental in working with the community who was fair, who was doing the right thing, and she was part of Integrated Johnson, which I think was the first high school to be integrated. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to come to, to hear about it because I did hear something about it. And to, to jump off of Margaret's comment, um, Tom Cole was, was my grandfather, and he, we often heard Mr. McClain's name in our household for a long time. Um, there's still a picture of him and my grandfather uh, on 46th Street. And if anything, any comment that I was stuck with me that he mentioned about some of the times in the 60s, and you've already mentioned this multiple times, was the cooperation, the different ideas, the different people that came together and discussed things. And if, if there's one thing I remember from discussing things like that with my grandfather, it's, it was that spirit of cooperation. I'll tell you one other anecdote about your, about your grandfather that I'm sure, he, I'm sure he learned a lot of this from McLean because they worked together. To, uh, Tom was the very young alderman uh, in the administration. Uh, he, I think he was very young when he was an alderman at that time. And uh, all these guys worked together. Judge Frank Cheatham, who became a Superior Court judge later, uh, and they, they had a whole group of them, but it was more, of a, you said the aldermen, it was more of an informal network of business leaders. The Jewish leaders in town were very, very active in this, and as Wade said, the, the Catholic hierarchy was very, very involved in this. But um, Tom was uh, county commission chairman about 
20 years after he was an alderman, maybe 25 years at a time when I was in politics. And um, the, the county commission that was in office just before he was chairman was very contentious. They screamed and hollered, fought at each other all the time. He comes in and it runs like a clock for four or eight years, however long it was. And then the day he goes out of office, it goes back to how it was before that. And mostly it was the same people on the county commission. So I was scratching my head at that. And I, I saw uh, Tom, uh, uh, and I went up to saw him, and I said, you need to teach me something. How did you do that? I said, I don't get it. It's the same cast of characters. They were crazy as hell. They, <laughs> they're crazy as hell again. He said, it's very easy. He says, when you're running a meeting, there are always eight meetings before the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a lesson for anybody running a meeting. You know, if, if you're going to have contention, um, you know, don't have the contention in the hall. Know where everybody is and understand where they're coming from beforehand. A very good lesson in life. <laughs> Um, let me talk a little bit about some of the records that we mentioned. Um, the Stephen Tuck interviews that were conducted in the early 1990s for his book, Beyond the Land, which is a very good book if you're interested in the civil rights movement in Georgia and Savannah. Um, to my knowledge, it's the only published, his very good academic history book that covers the civil rights movement in the state in Georgia. Um, Tuck conducted a series of interviews in Savannah with um, leaders um, in the movement. Um, about 26 of those cassette tapes were given to Mr. Law um, that were then deeded to the city as part of the WW Law collection um, when um, Wade was putting together his lecture. We were able to locate those cassette tapes and um, we had those um, sent to a conservation and um, digitization um, um, firm. And so we have um, conserved those and digitized them. And then Wade's um, clerical staff transcribed Mr. McLean's um, um, interview for us. So we have to get the rest transcribed still. But those will be accessible um, hopefully soon. We have some copyright issues we have to clear it with. Um, uh, getting release forms because what we have not located yet are the release forms for those interviews. But those interviews are wonderful, and there is a, a great interview with um, Mr. McLean's mother that talks about how hard everything was on their family and how scary things were, like finding burning crosses on your lawn at night. Um, so, you know, that's a wonderful collection. Um, Wade also talked about the little bit of records we have for Mayor Malcolm time as mayor and um, the um, city did not have a records management ordinance in place until the 1980s there was no Georgia um, Records Act until the 1980s so we didn't practice good records keeping always um, for much of the 20th century until the later part so the first mayor we actually have a good bit of records for is Mayor McLean and I brought some of those up here. We call them the speech file books, and I don't know who named them that, but the books actually contain copies of his speeches, copies of outgoing correspondence, um, lists of things that they were thinking about doing, proposals, um, proposals from African American leadership of what they wanted. So I've got five of those books laid out here. They have been fully digitized by the Digital Library of Georgia, so they are fully online and connected to the Civil Rights Digital Library too because they recognize how important these particular books are. But if you're interested, feel free to come up here. Just leave all your food and drink over there. So they're up here for you to look at. Um, there's the 1963 volume by far to me is the most interesting because it's talking a lot about what's going on in Savannah. There's also copies of letters that he wrote to Jackie Kennedy after the president was assassinated on behalf of the Savannah community expressing our condolences.